Hello, and welcome back to our Bible study in the book of Ezekiel. Today we will be concluding the prophecies against the Egyptians uh, in chapters 31 and 32. Uh, chapter 31 begins in June of 587 BC. This is uh, dated at this point in time. And Ezekiel 31 uh, d compares um, Egypt to uh, a great power and compares it to a great uh, tree, a cedar. <clears throat> when uh, Ezekiel is called upon to say these words to about the Pharaoh of Egypt, the comparison that gets made is with the empire of Assyria in verse 3. Now, this is somewhat striking and somewhat out of place. Um, Assyria had, was a great empire in the past. It had fallen about 25 years previously. Uh, its uh, great empire had been defeated by the Babylonians in 612 BC. So the question gets asked, why is Assyria mentioned here as the uh, great tree that is uh, compared to Egypt. Uh, there have been some other uh, translations and other uh, issues that have uh, been put in there. Some translations, the Revised Standard Version and the Good News Bible have put other, other words there. But most of the scholars have said that Assyria belongs there. As a comparison in the recent past of a great empire. And Egypt would have seen itself as a great empire. So it would have compared itself uh, with Assyria, this uh, great place. And the description in this uh, uh, chapter is of a, a great cedar tree that towers high and has uh, many birds within its branches and that it is beautiful and majestic and glorious. And the comparison is made again as it has been made previously, as has been made previously in, in Tyre in, in chapter 28, with the trees of Eden. That the trees of Eden would have envied uh, the glory of this, of this tree. So the question gets asked, why are these comparisons being made uh, to Eden, to paradise? And perhaps the most obvious reason is that all greatness comes from the hand of the Lord. That the greatness of Eden came from the Lord, and here too, that the greatness of Assyria, this empire, also came from the, 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 the Lord. So as Egypt sees itself in Assyria, and sees itself also in this great cedar tree, that Egypt must understand that its greatness would also come from the Lord. After the description, the poetic description of this great tree in the beginning of chapter 31, in verses 10 to 14, we see the, the downfall of the tree. That because it is a tree that towers high and its top is in the, is in the clouds, so what happens is that the tree becomes overcome by pride. That pride and arrogance are the sins that will uh, topple it, that it will be, um, because of that, it will be cut down and left as a stump, as a rump of what it once was. And that is what happened to Assyria. Assyria had been a great empire for so long, but then in 612 BC in the Battle of Carchemish, it is uh, beaten by the Babylonians. So God says here, if Egypt wants to see itself in Assyria and wants to see itself as this glorious tree, then it too, if it takes pride and arrogance as its main uh, focuses, then it too will fall. It too will be cast down. And it is said to go into uh, Sheol the land of the, 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 of the dead. Uh, 
In these chapters, we will see a lot about uh, Sheol, that this is the place where Egypt is going to go, into the land of the dead, into the shadows of the dead. And what I want us to to understand here in these descriptions of uh, Sheol and the land of the dead, I don't want us to get any sense that this is an actual representation of what the land of the dead will be. Ezekiel is speaking here in very uh, general terms, um, speaking in very general terms about what the land of the, of, the, of the dead is, what the grave is, what the pit is. This is not a you know, detailed geographical description of what life is going to be like in Hades or in hell or in heaven. This is just a a figurative sense that the tree is going to be cut down, and when the tree is cut down, it is cast into this dark place, which is described in verses 15 to 18. That this is where the trees will end up when they are destroyed, cast into this place. So this is important for us to to, uh, realize and recognize. Our next uh, oracle in the beginning of chapter 32 is uh, dated to March of 585, which is about seven months after the fall of Jerusalem and about two months after the exiles in Babylon hear about the fall of Jerusalem. So so Jerusalem has fallen, and now this uh, oracle is made against uh, Pharaoh. And it is similar to one we have seen earlier against Pharaoh, comparing him to a a crocodile, to a monster in, in the Nile. And one of the aspects of this particular pair, of this particular comparison, is that in verse 2, we see that Pharaoh considers himself, as it says, a lion of the nations. Considers itself a lion. But God says, what you really are is, what it says here, a dragon in the seas, in the river. This crocodile. And this this idea of of a delusion sets in that he thinks he's greater than he actually is. What he is is a crocodile, and what does and what and the, and the crocodile isn't this great majestic creature that everyone fears. This sort of towers over everything. Said the crocodile is in the river and it muddies it up. It sort of goes through this old muddy water. I said. And what's going to happen is, just the same as in chapter 29, we have this crocodile, this dragon, this this creature of the river brought out and cast under the ground and blotted out just to make sure that it is clear that God is in charge. Same thing happens. And as we sort of go through this, what we see is the reaction of the world to this in verses 9 and 10, which causes other peoples to be appalled at this. And then we see the desolation come in verses 11 to 15, from the sword of the king of Babylon, which will bring ruin to the pride of Egypt, that everything will be uh, desolate, that this land is going to be destroyed and cast to the side. And the mourning of the, of the nations comes in verse 16. We see this wailing over it, this wailing over the nation that we see. Verse 17, we have the seventh and final oracle against uh, Egypt in these four chapters. 
Uh, this one is dated to March of uh, 585. It's about two weeks after the previous one in, ch in this chapter, two weeks later. And what we see here is a desolation again. This uh, wailing over this beautiful nation that has gone down to rest in Sheol. And what we see is this description of being slain by the sword. The sword comes and destroys them. And they are cast into uh, Sheol. And then the rest of this chapter is a description of what is going on in Sheol. We have this uh, tour, as it were, of Sheol. It begins with the Assyrians. The Assyrians who are also in Sheol. And they, their empire, as I earlier said, had been destroyed uh, much earlier on. Uh, in verse 24, we see Elam is there. That was the nation that was to the east of Babylon. It is in modern day Iran. Um, and it had been conquered by the Babylonians as well. Uh, so it was also another empire that had fallen. Uh, Meshach Tubal is mentioned in verse 26. This is another uh, empire. This was in, in what is in modern day Turkey. Uh, so these are also uh, nations that are lifted up and they are, have been, their empire has been des destroyed. Uh, Edom is mentioned in verse 29, which is one of the neighbors uh, to Israel, which we saw in chapter 25, the judgment against them, the princes of the, the north and all the Sidonians. So this is sort of the Phoenicians and the Sidonians in verse 30, another empire that is cast to, to the side, as we saw in chapters 26 to 28. So with all these empires that have come and gone, the Egyptians find their place. Verses 31 and 32, Pharaoh finds his place with them in Sheol, in the darkness. And as I said before, this is not a literal description of what the abode of the dead is, is, is like. This is a figure, uh, a, a very figurative uh, dis description. And he and Pharaoh and the Egyptians find themselves there. And it says that he, that he will be comforted for all his multitude slain by the sword, that what he gets there is the bitter solace of knowing that he's not the only one that has gone against what God has said, that he's not the only one who has lifted up in arrogance and pride. And what we see here is the judgment against this nation. Now, these chapters on Egypt have been a description of God's judgment against a great power. It's, it's just in, and these, uh, these eight chapters from 25 to 32 have shown us that God is in control of all things, that the God of Israel is not just the God of Israel, but is the God of the whole world. And that the agents and the warfares and the battles that happen in that area in that time, that all of them are according to God's plan. That God can use agents such as Nebuchadnezzar in the destruction of these peoples for their pride, for their arrogance, for, for the lifting up of, them, of themselves. And as we continue on, we will see God's judgment turned against his own people. Let me turn to chapter 33. Let us pray. Lord God, as you have seen fit to uh, judge your people, and you have seen fit to give to us uh, these examples of uh, pride and arrogance as a warning. So let us be warned. Let us know that your power is greater than anything in this world and that we are in your care now and always. Amen.